Hello everybody, my name is Brady and we are back with another React video and today we're going to be checking out more Hamilton and we are on the semi-final song. We've been checking out more Hamilton on and off for I think over a year at this point and we're this close. We got this song and then we have the conclusion song but today we get to talk about the climax, the duel, the thing with... I, I, it's been so long. I, I put so much time into watching this musical and I've spread it out for so long. It feels like it's been forever. So I'm pretty excited to get to the end. Not just because I want to put the series behind me. Nothing against Hamilton, but... Uh, I've said this in the past. I think it overstayed its welcome. I think I should have uh, rushed this out a little bit earlier. It did not have to go over a year, but you know what's done is done. Today we're gonna put. Today we're gonna be talking about the world was wide enough. Um, so yeah, we got the duel. I, I guess we'll get it started. Take it line by line. I mean, you know how it is at this point. We've been doing this forever. Let's get it started. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are ten things you need to know. Number one. We rode across the Hudson at dawn. My friend William P. Van Ness signed on as my number, number two. two. Hamilton arrived with his crew. Nathaniel Pendleton and the doctor that he knew. Number I love that they drop names here. In a lot of cases throughout the musical, it features events that have many more important figures in them, but they find little sneaky ways to like write them out or they'll have another character take on an additional role that they probably didn't in real life. And, and they have little fun ways of working around the fact that a Broadway cast can only be so big. But here, they're, they're dropping names here. And these are the people who are going to really have the most influence on creating the narratives around this duel. I'm not going to go into every single possibility around the duel, but I will go through the ones that I think are more probable. Of course, you'll always have the option. They're available online. You can find the letters written by these guys. You have their names now, so you're good there. I'm, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the uh, on the most probable versions of the story of the duel between Hamilton and Burr. But we got names, that's good. I watched Hamilton examine the terrain. I wish I could tell you what was happening in his brain. This man is poisoned by political pursuits. Most disputes die and no one shoots. No Sorry, I want to stop at every other line at least. So whatever I can do there. Uh, I love that it's being told from the Burr perspective, uh, because we're not really supposed to know exactly what's happening in Hamilton's brain. Uh, he has his plan written out on paper, like we talked about in Best of Wives song. He wrote that he's going to throw away his first shot and potentially throw away his second shot. Okay, so on paper, we know his plan, but we also know that he doesn't really have to be held to that plan if he decides, oh, I'm going for it and I'm going for the win. I'm going to kill this guy. If he decides like, hey, I want to fire on Burr, he gets to go home. He gets to get rid of those letters. He doesn't get turned into a liar in posterity because he controls the narrative there. So... Like I said in the previous one, the letter is a no-lose situation. Of course, you write something down, make yourself look as favorable as possible, but it doesn't mean Hamilton completely understood what he was going to do going into this. Actually, a lot of his actions, and this isn't something that a lot of historians talk about. I, I think it's because it's uh, generally unsatisfying, uh, but it's possible that Hamilton wasn't 100% sure exactly how he wanted to handle this situation. There is certainly a chance that he wrote down his word and he was going to stick to it. But there's also like that little possibility. You see these little mixed messages come from Hamilton. Maybe there's like a little bit of doubt in his mind. Like when you get on the battlefield, you're thinking like, 
do I do I want to go through it like this or do I want to, you know, go through it like that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, so I always consider the possibility that when you see all these things that don't seem to make sense coming from Hamilton, maybe he wasn't a hundred percent sure because you got to think of the high stress nature of dueling. Hamilton drew first position, looking to the world like a man on a mission. So uh, with dueling, they uh, have various ways that they determine who stands where. And, and it was determined that Hamilton, I believe, would stand facing the sun, which would be a disadvantage if he intends on shooting Burr. Like, if he just intends on shooting in the air, then that's totally fine. And it doesn't really matter if he's facing the sun or not. Actually, it's probably better for him to face the sun if he wants Burr plane going overhead, it's better for him to face the sun if he wants Burr to be able to see, because if Burr has the glare of the sun in his face and then Hamilton delopes, it, it's possible that Burr won't see Hamilton's intentions as well. So actually, this points in the direction of uh, Hamilton uh, wanting to go through with his original plan. So that actually works there. This is a soldier with a marksman's ability. The doctor turned around so he could have deniability. Five. Now I didn't know this at the time, but we were near the same spot. My son died, is that why? That just is what it is. Gun with such rigor. I watched as he methodically fiddled with the trigger. Seven. Here's a, th a weird thing. When Hamilton's playing with the gun, like that's that's a mixed message there. You don't want to like really make if, if you want to shoot in the air, if you want to stop this, first of all, you could like use your words like a big boy or, or you could just not make it clear that you really want to shoot him. If you're really trying to figure the gun out, you're you might look like you're trying to make sure this thing's going to work very well right now and effectively myrtleize the guy walking across from you like it, it it really is a mixed message and apparently he took aim testing it out and even might have pointed it in burr's direction which that's uh threatening that that gives burr total legitimate reason to believe that he would fire so now we've got some points in one category some points in another category confession time here's what i got my fellow soldiers will tell you i'm a terrible shot I don't know if that's actually based on anything or if that just fits in with the line. No comment. Number eight, your last chance to negotiate. Send in your second, see if they can set the record straight. They won't teach you this in your classes, but look it up. Hamilton was wearing his glasses. Why? If not to take deadly aim, it's him or me. The world will never be the same. I had only one thought before the slaughter. This man will not make an orphan of my daughter. Number nine. And uh, I would say that Burr was incredibly close to his daughter. There's some like nasty rumors that go like incestuous rumors that go on around those two, which I, I think those things are just flat out malicious. Uh, but they, they were very close. And there's a. I think there's an H.W. Brands book specifically about their relationship. I don't know if it was any good or not, but like I, it might be somewhere to look like he does some pretty good stuff. Some of it's like, OK, some of it's pretty darn good. It, it I don't know. It, I, I take it book by book with him. Um, but yeah, I, I think that would have to be a consideration. And that seems to be a consideration that Hamilton doesn't ever seem to have when it comes to uh, the way he's handled his political career, his social life, his recklessness and in hopping into the military, into constant affairs of honor, duels. Uh, Hamilton does not seem to consider his family all that much. Actually, their financial situation after he's gone is going to be rather difficult because he uh, forsook, forsaken? He didn't take his military pension, which would really help his family. And they had to, like, go to the government and be like, can we please get that back? We could really use it right now. I know he said he didn't want it, but he was being stupid and not thinking about his family. Uh, he was thinking about his honor more than he thought about his family, which is very true. Look him in the eye, ain't no higher. Summon 
men are the courage you require, then count. I mean, if you're look him in the eye, aim no higher. That that's. I've talked about you don't actually want to shoot the guy in the face because it's a small target and these guns aren't very accurate. If anything, you want to aim lower than his eye. <laughs> Way lower than his eye. You you want to aim for the body. Uh, yeah, that That's a, a good target. With, with these guns where the bullet really rattles around a whole bunch in the barrel and uh, really can throw it off, you, you can't trust these guns to be accurate, so... Shoot lower, much lower. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, number ten, place is fire. I imagine death so much it feels more like a memory. Is this where it gets me? On my feet, several feet ahead of me. Got some callbacks. I see it coming. Do I run or fire my gun or let it be? There is no beat, no melody. I like the doubt in here because, like, we have the conventional narrative, but, like, you got to imagine the amount of stress that goes into this situation. So I like that kind of how that kind of ties into what I was already kind of thinking about Hamilton and how his actions didn't always seem to make sense. So if there is a little bit of doubt there, like, maybe, like, not even, not like a 50-50, but maybe, like, a 10% chance he was thinking, like, maybe I should fire my own gun. I don't know. My first friend, my enemy. Maybe the last Definitely not his first friend. If I throw away my shot, is this how you remember me? What if this bullet is my legacy? A legacy. What is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. I wrote some notes at the beginning of a song someone will sing for me. America, you great unfinished symphony, you sent for me. You let me make a difference. A place where even orphan immigrants can leave their fingerprints and rise up. I'm running out of time. I'm running in my time's up. Wise up. Eyes up. I catch a glimpse of the other side. Lawrence leads a soldier's chorus on the other side. My son is on the other side. He's with my mother on the other side. Washington is watching from the other side. Teach me how to say goodbye. Rise up. Rise up. Rise up. Eliza. So it talks about his uh, his grief for all the people he's lost. And there is talk about whether or not Hamilton was suicidal going into the duel. And if you are suicidal, you don't necessarily have to put the gun to your own head. You don't have to, like, necessarily kill yourself. But you could, in a sense be driven by your suicidal thoughts to have reckless behavior. I think of uh, these cases, have you ever, I don't know if you've heard of the term suicide by cop. Uh, it's a very fascinatingly tragic thing that these people who want to die will like, commit crimes or whatever and be violent towards like a police officer or something and try to get the police officer to shoot them it's incredibly awful it's it, it, it's just like the saddest concept you could ever hear of but i could imagine in a society where dueling is at least relatively commonplace somebody could walk into a duel with a similar recklessness, with a similar, uh, I guess, a, a similar just disregard for their own uh, well-being. I'm not, I'm not saying that that is the case, because I can't get in his head to that degree. It would be irresponsible for me to claim to understand that part. Uh, but I, I don't write it off as a possibility. It's absolutely possible. Um, uh, both him being, it, it would also explain kind of the, uh, some of the unusual behaviorisms that happen going into this. Uh, if you really are not in the best place, then, uh, who knows what that could drive you to do? What's it, like giving mixed messages like that? If, if you're, you're not in the right place, who you're not going to always make the most rational decision going forward. My love, take your time. I'll see you on the other side. 
Raise a glass to freedom. He aims his pistol at the skyway! So what happened here? This is, uh, we're, we're gonna talk about a couple of the most likely possibilities in my mind. And there are, of course, like other scenarios and we could talk about it all day if I wanted to go into every combination of things that could have possibly happened. It might take a little bit longer, but I think we can go through a couple that I think are very possible. So one thing that we're pretty darn sure of is that both men fired. Uh, not just Burr. Here, it's kind of hard to tell. It's just kind of... This just happens. It's all so fast and it's built up like it's so fast. It happened faster than Burr could process it. And that's nice. Uh, but it really obscures that the fact that the other gun did fire. So who shot first and what were the intentions? So I think it's been a minute since I've read the Chernow book. Uh, but I believe he went with the involuntary fire theory. So this is Hamilton raising his gun, ready to delope. He gets fired upon by Burr. So in this case, Burr fires first, and then Hamilton's gun goes off, kind of involuntarily. He gets hit. Oh, and he already had his finger on the trigger. He was ready to pull up, so his body just like... He just clenches and ends up firing, and the gun ends up shooting above Burr's head. Or, right, and you know, that theory is really interesting, and I think uh, Chernow is also one who tells the story of, like, Hamilton not really knowing that he fired, like, when he's wounded and he, they're taking him to be taken care of. He's like, be careful with the gun. It still has uh, ammunition in it. It, it. it has not been fired. And do you think Hamilton is willing to put on an act like that and, and pretend that he doesn't know it was fired in order to set the narrative, it, it would take a lot of commitment. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it, it would take a ton of commitment to do so. So that's one thing. And then there's the possibility that Hamilton fires and perhaps it was clear that he was firing to Delope and Burr shoots him anyway. Okay, that goes a little bit against the instant regret thing that we have here, but there there did seem to be some truth to the instant regret thing. That seems to be something that was uh, that was there. He he did have a concern because a lot of these duels, even when people got shot, people ended up being okay. So the idea, even if he intended to shoot him, he might not have even intended to kill him. But then there's also just the misunderstanding. Uh, form of telling this where we have Hamilton attempting to delope and he fires uh, seemingly like above Burr's head and maybe Burr misunderstands and thinks that he was fired upon and chooses to fire. Um, regardless, Hamilton put himself in the position to be fired upon by another person and I'm not saying that he deserved it, but he was like playing with his own life here. He was playing with fire here. He, he put himself on the field of battle, agreed that people would fire upon each other. He couldn't have been surprised that it actually happened. Um, it, it, it was incredibly reckless. So whatever you happen to believe, I, I guess it would come from your understanding of the two individuals, but neither of them seem to be acting perfectly in character from what we knew about them beforehand. So that makes it even harder to understand exactly what happened. I, uh, I like the, uh, the involuntary fire version of the narrative. I, I think that's a very, a very clean version of the narrative. It does account for a lot of different things. Uh, but I don't lean towards any one theory incredibly uh, passionately. It, it, I guess it doesn't really matter too much to me in the end. So let's continue. I strike him right between his ribs. I walk towards him, but I am ushered away. Hmm. They're rowing back. 
back across the Hudson. I get a drink. And apparently he went and got laid. That's 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 a side point of the story. But apparently that happened. Uh, I don't know how one uh, <laughs> could go and do so afterwards. I, after something traumatic like that, but I don't know, maybe it was exciting for him. That's that's a theory that I heard, that uh, probably the excitement of the situation might have made it even better for him. That that's a, that's a stupid side story that doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, but it's funny. I hear wailing in the street Somebody tells me you'd better hide Angelica and Eliza were both at his side when he died. Death. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know 100%, uh, but I think Angelica might have been visiting during this time. I can't remember completely, uh, but I, I think she would have been in the area. She was certainly back from England at this point, so yeah. Death doesn't discriminate. Between the sinners and the saints, it takes and it takes and it takes. This is beautiful. Little race and every picture it paints, it paints me in all my mistakes. When Alexander aimed at the sky, he may have been the first one to die, but I'm the one who paid for it. I survived, but I paid for it. Yeah. So after this, his he can't really go back. To his political career. He, he has to go into hiding for a little bit. He doesn't really get the book thrown at him yet. Uh, it's very interesting, though, what he ends up doing afterwards. He has nothing really left in this part of the country, so he ends up going west and trying to find uh, some sort of success over there. And he's even involved in what is now referred to as the Burr conspiracy, where he was getting people together possibly for some imperial ambitions. The question is, who for? Was it Burr trying to step up and take some territory and make his own country and be god king of Burrtopia out in the west? Or was it him... Uh, coordinating with the Spanish, who were also uh, in the area and have uh, imperial ambitions, though their empire is a bit on the decline. They, they would like to be able to secure uh, more American territory, of course. Uh, or, which is, this is a bit favorable to Burr and a bit naive, uh, Burr seeking out uh, Western territory in order to incorporate it into the United States, which I don't buy for a second. There's a great book about this by uh, James E. Lewis Jr. It's a thick read. It's very uh, dry, like 19th century politics stuff. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, Supreme Court case, and I think it's absolutely worth going into. Uh, the most interesting stuff in Burr's political career haven't even happened yet at the point the duel is. It gets better. And the fact that we don't even get to touch upon that in the musical just shows that Burr lived a full life. He, he did a lot of stuff. Now I'm the villain in your history I was too young and blind to see I should have known I should have known the world was wide enough. Sharpening your beak? Cool During the emotional part? Cool <laughs> The world was wide enough for both Hamilton Okay. Nope. Nope. Not right now. Um, so <laughs> we're just about at the end. We've got one more track to do, and then I'm done with talking about Hamilton for a little bit, I guess. I mean, there will be another occasion. He's so present in 
American politics, if I ever end up covering, like, early American history stuff, which is some of my favorite stuff, he has to come up. So there will be plenty of conversations about Alexander Hamilton in the future on this channel, but, like, as far as the musical goes, I'll be able to put it aside for a little bit, check out some other stuff, uh, uh, broaden what I talk about on the channel maybe a little bit, maybe uh, get into some of the series that I've kind of put on the back burner recently. I think being able to put this behind me uh, will give me a lot of room to do some stuff, some more stuff going forward. So that's the thing. Uh, the duel is fascinating. And uh, I hope you're not upset that I don't have a very conclusive answer about like how everything went down, but that that's history. Like we, we've got some theories, but we, it was very limited the amount of people that witnessed it. So we just kind of, pick from uh, the information that we have and try to piece it together in a way that makes the most sense to us. And uh, honestly, with dueling, with how it is as a practice, um, I don't really blame Burr any more than I blame Hamilton. Uh, he He's not really any more of a villain than Hamilton in, is in this. Hamilton... Uh, put himself in that situation and also he put Burr in that situation. They they put each other in this situation I, I it takes two to create a conflict like this. So for Burr to be uh, made into a villain in this uh, in this case, I think is uh, relatively uh, Unfair I mean at least not without acknowledging Hamilton's part in it. Like, nobody forced him to go down to the dueling ground. It was his own honor. It was, uh, I guess, if there was ever a place to use the term toxic masculinity, it would probably be around dueling, right? Like, the, the macho honor code that they, they followed sometimes to their death uh, yeah, that that's probably the best place to use that term. So it's a very interesting story. So I guess the next one will be uh, wrapping this series up in a nice little bow and uh, calling it a year on this series. Oh, gosh. What have I done? Have I really been doing it this long? Wow. All right. See you guys very soon with another one.